Hey guys, welcome back to the short term show. Today we have Robert Abasolo of the Rob Built YouTube channel. He is an expert in something that I run across fairly often. I've never actually seen anyone uh, successfully execute it. And he is an expert in uh, the tiny home uh, movement of short term rentals. So, Robert, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing. I have to say, I'm very, I'm very proud of you. I know, I know. In the show prep, we we rehearsed, but you said my name perfectly, Robert Abasolo. <laughs> very, very, and also you said my YouTube name, Rob Built, correctly. Most people say Ro Built, so you did your research. I did my research. <laughs> That's what I'm. I uh, I learned from the best from Howard Stern. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? You know how you ended up in the real estate investing world, and you know kind of what you're doing, how you ended up where you are. Yeah. So I am from. Let's see. I, I'm from Texas. I moved to Kansas City, and after living there for a couple, like I think three years, my wife and I were like, "Hey, let's move to LA." We've always talked about moving to the West Coast. Houses are four times the cost as our current house. What could go wrong? So we moved to LA and we started renting an apartment there. And well, our apartment there was $1,800 for like 600 square feet, something like that. And, you know, after paying my rent there for six months, I was like, man, I can't keep paying someone $1,800 for this. Like, let's buy a house. And my wife was like, can we afford this? And I was like, we cannot afford this, but we'll figure something out. And basically we, you know, ended up buying a house at the time and at that time, that house had like a studio apartment underneath it. And that's, I got into house hacking around that time and started Airbnb being my apartment uh, underneath me and the apartment that we moved into. And it was like kind of a very quick moment for me where like the wheel started to turn. And like, that was sort of my foray into real estate, if you will, like the house hack. And this is actually something that I, I really preach quite a bit because it's something that really kick started my career as a real estate entrepreneur, like, hey, what if someone else could pay my mortgage and my note and everything like that? So um, yeah, since then I, I've built a tiny house in my backyard and then I built another tiny house in Joshua Tree, California, and then a small home in Joshua Tree, California. I started a glamp site in Arizona. It's five units. There's a tiny A-frame there, an Airstream. We've got a, a Mongolian hut there and a couple of safari tents. And then I've got a chalet here in the Smokies and uh, I actually live here in the Smokies now as of two months ago. That is awesome. So uh, we're going to zoom in on all of that in just a second. So your portfolio is all short-term rentals and they're all either tiny homes or glamp sites, correct? Yeah, except for my sh my chalet here in... Well, okay, so I have a chalet here in the Smoky Mountains and then I also have a condo in Austin, Texas. Uh, and that is also on Airbnb as well. But overall... Uh, about eight to eight out of the 10 are like unique stays or, you know, kind of tiny places. That's awesome. I, I love Austin. I miss it so much. I went to UT and I lived there for six years. And then I also lived oh. in Los Angeles. So yeah, you and I have had some, a little bit of a oh, Okay. I didn't know you went to UT. That's cool. Yeah. So did I, obviously I actually went and I majored in advertising and I left that behind a week ago to get into real estate. That's awesome. Yeah, I actually, um, I went there on a soccer scholarship and I majored in corporate communication, which is basically nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I had a friend that did corporate comm. Yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. I did not know that about you. That's awesome. Hook them. So, Hook them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's dive into these tiny homes a little bit because I get, you know, as a real estate agent in multiple markets who specializes in short-term rentals, if I had a dollar for every client who came to me and said, I want to do tiny homes, I want to do a tiny home village, I want to do camping, I would have about $800. And I mostly roll my eyes because it takes a lot of work to do something like that. You can't just buy five acres and plop a bunch of tiny homes down. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And can you kind of dive into that for people who might be interested in getting into doing like a tiny home village, can you kind of explain the process? Because it really is not just, oh, look, five acres, I, I can pay $20,000 for this and just throw a bunch of stuff down. Yeah, tiny houses, big problems. Uh, yeah, so as someone that in pretty well versed in the tiny house world, so there's a couple things to kind of unpack there. Like, A, I think the misconception in general is that tiny houses are cheap. Uh, they can be, like if you build them yourself, and if you build them on wheels, certainly like they, you could save some money there. But for me, like 
my tiny house in Joshua Tree, California was $165,000 to build. A lot of people thought I was crazy for doing that because it was only 300 square feet. But what people don't realize is there are so many sunk costs involved with the tiny house, right? You have to do a foundation. You have to do connect to utilities. You have to do a single septic tank. You have to do a single like electrical panel, for example. And those are all fixed costs in the construction that are typically divided over a thousand to three thousand square feet. So when you're dividing that over three hundred square feet, it ends up being a very, very expensive journey. So I made the very conscious decision though when I was getting into the tiny house world to go tiny house on a fixed foundation specifically versus a tiny house on wheels because technically speaking, tiny houses on wheels are depreciating assets. Like the moment you build them and drive them, they're worth less and you'll, they'll never be worth what you paid for it in 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now. Whereas a tiny home on a fixed foundation is a real piece of real estate because you're going through inspections, you're getting an address assigned, you know, you're building it from the ground up. So that was kind of my journey from the very beginning. Um, I haven't actually done a tiny house on wheels specifically. I've done a couple of Airstreams and everything like that. But kind of fast forward to now, after having done a couple of these, I bought a house in Sevierville, Tennessee on 50 acres with the intention of building a tiny house village. Um, as you said, very hard to, to, to permit, not really something that you just do, right? Like I, I know a lot of people want to build a tiny house village, but they don't really understand the logistics and the red tape involved. So I'll try to give it to you like as concisely as possible. Um, my place is zoned agricultural one, uh, meaning that it is kind of like the lowest tier of zoning. There are several tiers, right? There's like agricultural, there's residential, there's commercial, and then there's a bunch of stuff in between. Agricultural is kind of like that baseline uh, from my understanding with the county. So it's a little bit easier to permit something like this because it's agricultural. There are just more uses that I could use for my land. So I really kind of looked out there um, whenever I was looking for this specific house because it was the only house in severe, like in the area that had 50 acres or really much acreage at all. And I was honestly, I was ready to uh, throw in the hat and just kind of give up and move, try Asheville. But my short-term rental shop realtor actually <laughs> pulled this one out of nowhere. And I was like, wow, like this fits the bill exactly. So I bought this house. It's zoned agricultural one. There's a few steps involved to kind of get to the finish line. So step one, I have to work with the civil engineer who is going to come out, who has come out. And he's going to draw a master plan of my property and kind of put where the different ravines are and the different gorges and the different streams and all that kind of stuff on my property. And then he has to kind of like draw a schematic of where like I want my first phase of my tiny house village to be. And he has to approve and stamp it with his professional engineering stamp that kind of certifies that I'm not going to be encroaching too much on mother nature or on ravines or on anything like that. Once that's done, I go to the planning and zoning commission. They give me a approval, but really they're going to give me a lot of feedback that we go back and forth. Once they give me approval, I have to go to my neighborhood, present it to all the neighbors, get their approval. Once they approve, I go to building and safety. And you would think that like I'm at the finish line here, <laughs> but because it's a tiny house, building and safety officials typically don't really understand the concept of building a 200 square foot house. So I have to really get them on board with why it's small. And the thing is, there are so many regulations and codes that I have to adhere to. That's very difficult to do when your minimum space is, when your maximum space is 200 square feet. So there's a little bit of kind of romancing of the concept with the building and safety um, kind of officials to get, get them on board and kind of co-sign what I'm doing here. And once they approve, then I can actually start constructing the thing. So it, it, it's a bit of a journey, <laughs> to put it lightly. Awesome. And that's a really good point that I think a lot of people don't think about is you have to get approval from these government offices. And a lot of times, you know, government offices are the last to catch up with technology. These are not people that are like on the cutting edge watching HGTV, like, oh my gosh, tiny homes. Yes, this is what we're doing now. Um, you really do have to get some of the dinosaurs on board and make them understand. Yeah. yeah and I mean, that's kind of the, yeah, that, that, that's kind of the issue, right? Is like when I moved here, I brought my Airstream, it's a renovated Airstream and I wanted to turn it into an Airstream tree house. So I was basically going to like build a big deck, like 20, 30 feet in the air create my tree house onto it. It was going to be within the trees. When I told this to the building inspector, I mean, I think I melted his brain. He was like, wait, <laughs> hold on. 
you want to put an airstream in the trees? You know, and I was just like, uh, you know, really trying to like help them understand. It's like, it's Airbnb. It's cool. Like I've got this YouTube <laughs> channel and, you know, I want to bring tourism to the, to the area and like, it'll be great publicity. And he was just like not having it. So I kind of resigned <laughs> to just like, all right, I'm just going to put it on the floor. <laughs> and that is Sevier County in a nutshell for you. I love it. I yeah. have a lot of investments there, but it's, it's just kind of like that. Um, so for somebody who's going through this whole process, how long does this take to do all this engineering and get all these approvals? And what's the cost associated with that? You know, I'm still kind of figuring that out. Um, I don't really know the answer to that yet, but from a general timeline perspective, like as soon as my civil engineer came out and here's the deal with civil engineers, like you kind of, if you're doing this and you're like a mom and pop, uh, you don't really want to hire like a civil engineering firm, a civil engineering firm could charge you like, I don't know, three to $700 an hour, right? Cause they're a company with overhead and all that kind of stuff. So you want to find someone who's like a one man show, uh, you know, just one person that's like, I, I do it all. I'm a freelancer or they're retired and they do everything themselves. Right. So I actually reached out to a civil engineering firm and the guy was like, Hey, you know, I really love your concept. Think we're going to be a little expensive for you. So uh, I have a friend. He's in this line of work. You know, I, I'll, I'll refer you to him. He he retired and he kind of does it on the side. So this civil civil engineer, instead of charging me like three to seven hundred dollars, he charges me a hundred dollars an hour. So that's kind of like the general cost for his uh, time. And he got it, he got it done pretty quickly. I mean, it took him like a week or two to to come out and draw the schematic of it. The civil engineering cost is probably going to be the biggest cost of this entire kind of permitting process. And I will, by the end, have paid him between five and $6,000. So I would say all in, we'd be looking at about $10,000 for, for permits and, you know, engineering and all that jazz. Okay. That's not terrible. Uh, it's really just a time investment and like of making sure, pushing the project along to the next step and the next step. Yep, absolutely. It's it's mostly just the time. And it's not really like, the problem is that it's inconvenient time. So it's like, while it could be an hour or two every week, it's an hour or two whenever they decide to call you and you have to drop everything and attend to their phone calls and answer their questions and get them documents. So it's not like it's time intensive, but it is inconveniently timed throughout <laughs> your day whenever it does come up. Like Airbnb, you know, that, right. I mean, that, that's Airbnb too, right? <laughs> absolutely. So I want to back up a little bit to when you were talking about properties on wheels versus not on wheels. And I think that is so important because a lot of people that want to do tiny homes, they want to do them on wheels because they think, I think mistakenly, that it's going to be more versatile that way. Maybe they could move something from one state to another state and, you know, move their little village around. But um, you make a really good point that if it's on wheels, it's not going to be worth anything in 10, 20, 30 years. But if it's an actual piece of real estate, it all of a sudden is an appreciating asset. That's genius. I never thought yeah. of that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, we'll, we'll put it, put some numbers here. So my, my tiny house in Joshua Tree, I built it for 165. About two weeks ago, an investor reached out and offered me 450,000 for it. And I built, I finished building it a year ago. So obviously that's Joshua Tree. The appreciation out there is just crazy right now. But that just goes to show you that because I decided to go through the process of building on a fixed foundation, it had the opportunity to appreciate. And there's kind of some other problems with the tiny house on wheels too, even besides the depreciating side of it. I love them, first of all. I, I really do. And I think they are the most marketable and the most profitable forms of Airbnb. But you're always kind of looking behind your shoulder, I think, because most counties and most cities across the country don't really accept them and don't really let you plop them down. Most of the time, I would say like 90% of the people that are putting tiny houses on their properties across the country, they're typically out of code. But with that said, you know, if you put a tiny house in Sevier County, there's like one person that works at that office. So they're on a complaint basis. It's not like they're driving around looking for your tiny house, but either way, for me, I just like to be as buttoned up as possible, especially when we're talking about such expensive investments that it's just not worth it for me to like move it around. If like, if they come in, they say, Hey, you got to shut this down. I don't want to have to go find somewhere else to put it. I would rather just go through the work now and save myself from being highly inconvenienced, like six, 12, 18 months down the road. 
That makes a lot of sense. And along those same lines, so let's talk about Airstreams and Airstream communities. So the, the first one that I became aware of was uh, Liz Lambert with Bunkhouse, who has El Cosmico in uh, Marfa, Texas. I think that one's been around for 10 or 15 years now. Mm -hmm. she's I'm a big fan of her and all of her hotels and all the things that she's done. And uh, Joe's Hot Coffee got me through uh, college in Austin. Uh, so tell me a little bit about getting, you know, refurbishing an Airstream. Where do you have those? How do you make it work? in that aspect of renting it as an Airbnb rather than on a foundation. Yeah. So that one, yeah, that one requires a little bit of creativity to kind of get into, but well, it's much like a house. You find an Airstream with like good bones. You say, Hey, I can spend about 1500 bucks and I'm going to be good to go. Right. What people don't really know is, or realize um, is if you buy an Airstream for $5,000, you could very, and I mean very easily put in thirty to fifty thousand dollars like renovating it um, if you wanted to renovate it well and correctly. So I've almost purchased an airstream several times over the years to renovate as a personal project. And every time that I look into it and I do the research, I just find all these people that are like, don't do it. We're in fifty thousand dollars and we're still not done. And so I've walked away and I always look for that kind of like that one airstream that's like perfect, right? So finally, about six months ago, I think, I found an Airstream in LA. Um, it had really good bones. It was all original. It was a 1966. Like all the cabinets were original, the stove. It was like very vintage and kind of like very cool on the inside, like mid-century almost um, with like the stove and the fridge. So it was in good enough condition for me to say, okay, I think that I can make this work. I think I can actually refinish this and not have to like rip it out. What people kind of get into the weeds is like, if you have to gut your Airstream, you're in really big trouble. Like that's whenever you start spending a lot of money to replace panels and windows and floors and all that stuff. But all of that was intact for me. So all I did was kind of came in and replaced, like I refinished the, the cabinets. I did new countertops in it and I repainted like the bathroom, like shower panel and all that kind of stuff. So I bought mine for $23,000. I put in about $10,000 into it and I'm not completely done on it. I've spent 33,000 so far with about another $2,000 or so I'll be done with that. And yeah, there's a couple of things that you have to keep in mind when you're running it as an Airbnb, a water, B power and uh, everything that kind of goes along with that, like bathrooms and all that type of stuff. So typically, um, what a lot of people do is they kind of tie into their own house. They'll, you know, put a water hose that kind of feeds into the airstream or run an electrical cable, like a extension cord that feeds the electricity. But if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you really have to start kind of thinking about how to compensate for a lot of that stuff. So in Arizona, for example, we have a giant water tank where we have water hauled in on a weekly basis to, um, basically fill it up with water and that's what feeds like our shower and stuff like that and then we have solar panels that provide just enough power for the lights but because we're in the desert it gets very hot and it gets very cold like we simply could never produce enough energy to completely cool or completely um heat an airstream so we actually don't offer heating or cooling in our airstream in the desert and you would think that a lot of people complain about like how hot or how cold it gets in there but for the most part, I think people kind of come into it understanding that it is an off the grid experience. And so um, for the most part, people have a pretty good time at our Airstream. Wow, you just blew my mind <laughs> that no heating or cooling and people are still coming and renting. Well, OK, and there's some caveats to that. So, okay. <laughs> you know, as an Airbnb host, like I try to caveat everything. Like if you read my listing and you're like on the fence my goal is for you not to book, right? right? Like we say everything that could go wrong. Hey, if it's sunny, if it's not sunny outside, you're not going to have power. Hey, if it's freezing outside, the water's going to be frozen and you're not going to have water. Uh, hey, there might be wildlife. Hey, this and that, right? So, hey, you might find some dust in the Airstream because we live in a desert and it's super windy and dust flies everywhere at all moments in the day. So we try to like bring that up to people <laughs> like as much as possible and I would say like 90% of people are like, okay, this is what I'm signing up for. Let's do this thing. But like the 10% of people out there like that don't read come in expecting to like stay at the Hilton or the Marriott or the W, right? And so like they, yeah, sometimes we'll get some complaints and everything like that. And it's on us to like remind them kindly like, hey, 
as noted in the listing, we don't provide water when it's zero degrees outside because the water is frozen. Uh, so there's a little bit of a guest journey there too. That's pretty cool. So let's talk about uh, the the numbers on these things. So you've got uh, your place, maybe a couple places in Joshua Tree, and mm -hmm. uh, then you've got your glamping site in Arizona that are up and running right now. You don't have any that are up and running in the Smokies yet, right? Not yet, no. Going through the permitting okay. on that so far. Okay, cool. So let's talk about the numbers on these. How are they, you know, what, what kinds of returns are you seeing on each? Yeah, sure. So let's start with my tiny house in my backyard in LA. I built that as an ADU, also known as an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, that one cost me about $72,000 start to finish. That was with me doing a lot of the work. Um, I rented that to a friend for a long time for $1,500 a month. And then I put it on Airbnb uh, after he moved out. And I, on the Airbnb, I was grossing between three to $4,000 a month on it. And my monthly note on it was $671 because I took out like a private loan, like a home renovation loan to do that. Uh, I've since refinanced it into my main mortgage. So yeah, that it, it went from 671 to much lower than that technically if you're calculating it over 30 years. So before the pandemic, Three to four thousand dollars a month. Uh, pandemic hit. I decided to switch into long-term rentals on Airbnb, meaning I could make more money on Airbnb than I would with the traditional twelve-month lease. And now, consistently, I'm bringing in twenty-two hundred dollars a month to twenty-four hundred dollars a month on that specific house. So for me, big win for me. I love getting that. Uh, I love long-term tenants on Airbnb. Starting to become a little bit of my favorite type of guest at the moment, but. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, because, you know, you're still getting those returns from Airbnb that are higher than long term rentals, but you don't have to deal with like the daily ins and outs and stuff like that, which matters less when you automate your business. But either way, I've got I've got two or three long term tenants in my Airbnbs right now spread across my portfolio. And it's so awesome to not think about, you know, that right now. Um so that's that, right? Tiny House LA, boom. Let's go to Tiny House in Joshua Tree. So I think um, I'd have to look at my numbers, but in December, I grossed $9,700. I think in January, I grossed $7,000. February, I think I grossed $7,000. And then March, I think I'm going to do maybe $8,000. So my profit on my tiny house in Joshua Tree, $165,000. My expenses come out to about $1,200 a month. My profit is typically five to, although I guess it's like five to $7,000 a month, which is the biggest of slam dunks one could ask for. Yes, it is. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I keep seeing Joshua Tree uh, in on lots of lots of places as a great place to invest in in short term rentals. And I keep kind of sniffing around, but I have a limiting belief that maybe you can dispel because I do that for people all the time. Like, no, short term rentals are great. What are you talking about? I'm nervous about owning real estate in California. So can you <laughs> kind of can because you know it's just everything seems to go crazy there before anywhere else I own right now in Tennessee, Florida, Alabama, and Nebraska. So those are states that um, it's kind of the last of any new wave of regulations or anything like that, whether it's long-term mm -hmm. or short-term. Uh, you know, our property taxes are a little high in Florida, but not too bad. But tell me about owning an Airbnb in California and uh, dispel my limiting belief. Yeah, sure. So it's really not that bad. I mean, well, first of all, like I, that's my only frame of reference. So honestly, maybe it's going to be a lot <laughs> easier for me as an owner in, in other states and stuff like that. But I would say the property taxes are high. And I would say if you want to invest in California, uh, you really have to invest in places that are very like that embrace short term rentals. So for example, in LA, I started my Airbnb journey there. And the reason I have long term tenants there is because I can only host short term for 180 days out of the year. And I'd have to get a, a permit for that, which would cost me $80. And I have to live on site. And past that 180 days, I have to apply for a long term, short term permit for $800. And they may uh, approve or deny me. If they deny me, I, I don't get the $800 back. So for me, the loophole that I found was if you host for 30 days or more, it becomes a long-term rental, even though it's on Airbnb. So that's why my LA house, I have two long-term tenants on Airbnb there, simply because I had to kind of like work with the regulations in Los Angeles, 
also Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, some of those bigger cities, they have such big housing prices that typically the legislation is not going to favor giving away housing, right? Giving away housing to evil Airbnb landlords. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not going to ever invest in those cities for the purposes of Airbnb, but a place like Joshua Tree thrives and their economic uh, kind of status is really built on the tier of tourism and all the people coming in. So I never really have to worry about Joshua Tree shutting down short-term rentals because we make up such a part, such a big part of their economy. So I don't think it's that bad, but um, certainly something to consider. I mean, I will say that if you're building something from scratch in California, whew, yeah, that that's a journey. Probably, probably that's going to be your biggest hurdle is just all the permitting, all the red tape and all that kind of stuff. But with that said, and this is kind of my general mantra in real estate in general, is like if you're part of that 0.01% of people willing to put in the work and go through the red tape of making something happen like that, there's a lot of money on the other side of it. And so that's kind of my general thought process on like tiny homes, glamp sites, tiny house villages. Like not a lot of people want to put in the work to actually establish those. But for those of us that do, there is a large profit kind of waiting on the other side of that. Absolutely. If you put in the work on a lot of things, <laughs> that's usually yeah. where the profit is. Uh, and there's, I, I mean, I can tell you, you are literally the only person that I've seen out of literal hundreds who have asked about it and almost and kind of started to go down the road who's been successful with it. So that speaks a lot to to your worth ethic, work ethic. So congratulations on that. I appreciate that. Do you want to <laughs> do you want to chat quickly about the kind of the rest of the numbers on the the spread here? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Cool. So I built a small home. It wasn't quite a tiny home, but a small home in Joshua Tree, California. It was 800 square feet. That was all in at 275. Um, so we basically built that at 275. We had it live in December. December, we grossed um, $9,000. January and February, we grossed $11,000. And this was kind of during the stay at home order and stuff happening in California. But we were projecting in our kind of peak seasons, we were going to be grossing. This doesn't even include cleaning, by the way. Um, we were projecting to, to gross between twelve dollars and $15,000 a month on that house uh, and make about at, le at least six figures on that $275,000 house. But wow. we were thinking it was going to gross between like one twenty dollars and one fifty dollars a year with a profit of about $100,000 to $110,000. I wish I could tell you more definitively, but we just we decided to toss it up on the market at a dumb price and um we're like all right what would we sell this house for uh 650 okay let's put it up there and it ended up selling we just closed on it like last week at 670 so um i i'm going to miss that airbnb because it was <laughs> highly profitable um but that house was set to you know to produce like 12 to 15k a month after we had you know kind of had one more month of reviews under our belt but that's okay so as you can see, building small and tiny, as long as there's an experience there, the profit is there waiting. Uh, kind of fast forwarding here a little bit to my Glamp site. Here's where it gets really, really crazy. So a Glamp site, you could buy uh, a, a bell tent, you could furnish it, you could build uh, a deck, all that jazz. That is going to cost you, let's see, I lay it out and I lay it out at about $16,000 typically with the people that I work with. $16,000 will get you all in. If you hit it right, if you find a great location somewhere in the country by a national park, you could produce between forty dollars to $55,000 gross on that $16,000 bell tent. Uh, that's typically where we net out. Um, a Mongolian hut will cost you about $50,000 all in. Um, that will gross you between seventy dollars and $80,000 a year. Uh, our Airstream that has no AC and no heat. We do have a propane heater in there, but other than that, we bought that for $33,500. And on our first year, we grossed $40,000. Um, and then we have a tiny A-frame that we built for $35,000. In our first year, we grossed $35,000 on it. So as you can see, the numbers and uh, yeah, the ROIs make a lot of sense on the glamping side of things, but it's a journey to kind of get it all set up, of course. Wow, that is amazing. Those are great numbers. So my next question, I think a lot of people are like waiting for me to ask this. How are you financing the builds of these things? And on the stuff that's not, you know, traditional real estate, how are you financing the the rehabs and the setup and all that? Sure. So uh, creatively is the short answer. But um, okay, so we'll start with like my tiny house in my backyard. I took out a personal 
uh, home renovation loan through a company called Lightstream. It was a 7.54% interest uh, over seven years. So not the most beautiful setup. And, you know, if I could go back, I would do it again because that's what kind of got me into all of this. I put $16,000 of my own personal savings into it. I put $11,000 on a 27% interest credit card. Not recommended to anybody listening to this, but I was 27. It was like my first deal, if you will. Um, so that was like the first one. Then in Joshua Tree, when I decided to build my tiny house there, I had all this equity from building a tiny house in Los Angeles. So I took out a $87,000 home equity line of credit on my, my house in LA. And I put that into the tiny house. My parents are partners on it. They put in $40,000. And I learned from my mistakes of using a high interest credit card. And I used a 0% interest credit card that was 0% interest for 18 months. And once it was all built, uh, I was all in at 165. I then did what's called a cash out home, uh, sorry, a cash out refinance, where the bank came in and gave me 75% of my appraised value. And pretty much to the dollar, I got paid back every single dime that I put into that house. Um, then my small home in Joshua Tree, California, I did a new construction loan on that. Those are typically going to, you know, require 10 to 20% down to do that. Um, and so that was completely a, a construction loan. I worked with a partner on that. We split it 50, 50. He put in the funds. I kind of ran the project and taught him to, how to, how to do a new construction. And then with all the glamp site stuff, I mean, that was just, you know, we started with $10,000, like, you know, me and two partners and we cobbled it together and we put one tent out there and pretty much never spent that money and kept rolling it into the next tent and the next head, and then the hut, and then the Airstream, and then the A-frame. So that whole business grew entirely from just our initial $10,000 investment, which really came from a couple of the Airbnbs that we had, which we were doing rental arbitrage at the time. But very quickly, we were like, we want a business that's going to build us wealth over the years, not necessarily like a temporary business, like rental arbitrage, that only will last you through the life of the lease. So we were making money in that model and quickly pivoted to the glamp site side of things. That is so interesting. And I agree, like arbitrage can be a really great way to just generate some cash flow just to get some cash. But it really is just kind of creating a job for yourself rather than creating actual wealth. So I 100% agree on that. It can be a great way to get your feet wet, but mm -hmm. it shouldn't be the end goal for sure. Absolutely. I started in arbitrage. I'll always be thankful for it. You know, I always say it can get you rich, but it's not going to get you wealthy, right? It'll make you money now, but 30 years from now, that business probably won't exist. Whereas if you heavied up on houses and you expanded your portfolio and you focused on that side of things, 30 years from now, if you still had that portfolio, you can retire, you know, wealthy, a millionaire, a multimillionaire, it just depends on the size of your portfolio. Exactly. So you've kind of touched on this in a few of your previous answers, but haven't asked it specifically. So when you go to either start a glamping site or, you know, buy some more Airbnbs, how do you choose your market? So for me, I am no longer investing in metropolitan areas. So you'll never really find me in investing in a Houston, uh, a Dallas. I kind of wish I invested in Austin, but that's okay. Uh, New York, San Francisco, LA. Like I don't really want any of those things. If you approach me and you said, Hey, I've got an off market deal in LA. It's this sick, you know, LA downtown loft. It's half price. Like I wouldn't go with that. Uh, no one is looking to rent a downtown loft in LA right now. I am 1000% heavying up on national parks. So the Smoky Mountains, Joshua Tree, Arizona. And it was actually like not really intentional until I looked at my portfolio and I was like, oh my God, like I'm doing national parks. Of course, like, of course, <laughs> this is the strategy because you don't have to market the Grand Canyon. You don't have to market the Smoky Mountains or Joshua Tree. Millions of people go there every single year. Um, so because of that and because of the foot traffic and because of how many short-term rental owners thrived during the pandemic, even with everything going on, people in these locations were still making a lot of money and still very profitable. So for me, I will probably always be focusing on some form of a national park, but this kind of goes even bigger to that, right? Like national parks, state parks, national forests, destinations. And when I say destinations, I mean like ski towns, mountain towns, lake towns, beach towns, and then small towns with some kind of gimmick to it, like some kind of niche or some kind of attraction. So for example, right outside of San Diego, there's a small little place called Julian, 
very popular for apple picking and pies and stuff like that. Or right outside of Austin, as you probably know, Fredericksburg, right? German town, German food. You go there, you, you go there for the weekend and you enjoy kind of like the, the presence there, right? Um, to me, like these types of small towns are experiences. So between experiences in small towns to national parks, that's kind of where I'm heavying up. And like next, I'm actually going to Shenandoah. So I'm going to try to build a portfolio around the country that revolves around some form of a park. I think that's a really great strategy. And I think, I mean, I'm only in one national park right now. My others are in destination towns, beach towns. But um, if you look at the data, at least in the Smoky Mountain National Park of the park visitation, which is only a portion of the data of the tourism of the entire area, but it's the most documented, uh, you can kind of see in the last two recessions, which I don't know if coronavirus is a recession. I I'm not an economist, but it certainly is an yeah. economic event. So in right. the past two, you can see both in the 2008 through 2012 time and then this past year, the tourism didn't really change. The home values dropped because of, you know, whatever economic circumstances are happening in the world, but the tourism didn't really take a dip. So it's almost like doing it that way and following your strategy is a little bit, nothing's recession proof, but recession resistant in a sense. Yep, definitely. <clears throat> and also like just so something to note on about these areas is when you go and you examine the short term rentals in those spaces, like go look at Zion, Yosemite, Big Bend, like anything. Uh, the Smoky Mountains is probably the only one that doesn't count. But if you go look at your housing options, you're typically going to find a Super 8, uh, Motel 6 and an old creaky lodge, or you'll find Airbnbs where everyone took cell phone photos and they're like 500 year old houses with, you know, granny furniture in it. Right. So there's such a big opportunity to kind of come in and take over these towns with like a really nice short term rental, really nice furniture, really nice professional photos. And you could really stand out in these towns very easily if you put in a decent amount of effort to have like a sparkling Airbnb. Exactly. It's your the bar is kind of low in terms of lodging in a lot of those places. So all you have to do is have a nice place and you're going to do well. Pretty much. I consult clients like every day on, you know, how to find the right Airbnb and what market to go into and all that kind of stuff. And so they always bring me ideas like some national park or some state park by them and we'll start comping it out. And I'm like, oh, my God, I need to like get into this town. Like I, <laughs> there is not a nice Airbnb in this town. So there is a big need for it pretty much, I think, across the entire country, except for places where the cat's kind of out of the bag, like Joshua Tree or the Smoky Mountains. <laughs> right, right. The cat is definitely out of the bag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you started it, you know, when you went on the Bigger Pockets <laughs> podcast. Inadvertently, <laughs> I was just telling people how I built my wealth and then it ended up being a thing. Uh, yeah. But I mean, the returns are still there. The returns are still there. And uh, it really is a great spot because, as you mentioned with Joshua Tree, it's the town, the whole, all the towns are dependent on tourism and short term rentals are a big part of that. So you don't really ever have to worry about anti-short-term rental regulation there. Yeah, that makes me feel really nice, especially <laughs> considering I like, quit my job and moved here to build a <laughs> tiny house village. So, Exactly. I'm glad you can, you can feel warm and fuzzy about that. You don't have anything yeah. to worry about. Awesome. So last three questions of our show. Uh, you have totally dropped some amazing wisdom nuggets, and I appreciate that a lot. I think that people are really going to love this episode. So uh, what advice would you give to 20 year old Robert? Um, man, I guess I wish I would have gotten, I would have bought a house sooner. Um, you know, I was an apart, I was a realtor at a certain point at, at UT. I was what's called an apartment locator. So I had my realty license and, um, my realtor's license. I don't know why I called it that, but, um, I was an apartment locator. I would make first month's rent as a commission. So if I found someone in an apartment, the apartment complex would pay me first month's rent. And then I would split that with my broker and get 50% of that. So at the time, you know, I was making thousands of dollars, uh, thousands of dollars. And I just, you know, <laughs> I don't know what I spent it on. But if I had just like put it all into a house in Austin, you know, like that's kind of like my biggest regret is like I thought about it. My roommate and I were roommates for like, three or four years. And we we're always like, man, we should buy a house. And like with the amount of m money that we're spending on rent, we should buy a house, you know? Um, and we never did. And I'm kind of just like, man, that really would have kickstarted me into the world because I've always just 
wanted to get into real estate. My parents were in real estate. They didn't really have a lot of luck with it. And I always wanted, but I was always interested in seeing their journey. And I always wanted to start, but I was always too scared to start. So I kind of wish I could have just gotten into it um, because I actually could have when I was 20 or 21, but that's okay. Uh, because, you know, it led me to where I am now. But if I could have gotten started sooner, I think that's kind of like the biggest thing I could say is like, no matter how you get it, whether it's a house hack or buying a house or rental arbitrage, being one of the first people on the Airbnb platform, uh, I don't think it was, well, actually maybe it was around 10 years ago, but eight years ago, um, I wish I could have just gotten into the game a little sooner. I agree. I have those exact same Austin regrets of not buying like East 6th, East Riverside in 2008, 2009 when I was there. I've already talked about that on the podcast. So people are going to be like, okay, stop talking about that, Avery. But um, (laughs) it's a big regret. (laughs) I mean, Riverside especially was not a place to be. Like it was not a nice part of town. It's so funny because in retrospect, it really wasn't that bad. But when I was there in 2008 to 2012, Riverside was like, oh, you you live in Riverside? Okay, well, all right, all right. You know, because it was like not the nicest part of town or whatever. But now, look who's laughing. All the people yep. that bought there. Exactly. <laughs> so piggybacking off of that question, what advice would you give to a new investor who's looking to get started now? You know, it's so funny because I've listened to a thousand podcasts and there's always one piece of advice that people say that I'm that I would always be like, oh, so annoying. But it's the truest piece of advice and it's get started now. Stop thinking about it. So many people kind of start overanalyzing deals and we suffer from what's called analysis paralysis. And here's kind of the problem with that. Like there's no such thing as too much research. It's always going to benefit you at a certain time. But the thing is, there's like, for example, if you take school, in college, let's say you get a degree, you learn everything that you, you think you learn everything. But honestly, when you actually start working, that's whenever you're able to apply everything that you've learned and actually learn what you went to school for. Like that's actually where you get the experience is actually doing the job. School is kind of like the foundation. And so I kind of attribute that somewhat to real estate where you do so much research. You could read a thousand books. You can listen to a thousand podcasts. You can watch a hundred YouTube videos. And you're not, you're still not going to be able to like know everything there is to know until you actually get into a flip, until you actually get into a new construction, until you actually get into an Airbnb. Like all the research that you're doing is really just preparing you to like stress less whenever you're actually in the field and doing it. So you're trying to solve for a thousand things whenever you get into a new project, um, an Airbnb, a construction, whatever it is, there are a thousand problems to solve for. But if you try to solve for all 1,000 problems before you get started, you're going to get overwhelmed, frustrated, and you're going to give up before you even start. Like for me, there were so many projects that I've passed on, you know, from 25 to 30 years old that I got too scared to do it because I was trying to over research it. So I think have confidence in yourself, take a bet on yourself that you're a smart person, that you've done enough research, and like get into your first deal and figure it out. It may not be perfect. It may not be smooth sailing, but most people that have had a bad real estate deal and have gone on to have success would never take back their first deal because of all the stuff that they've learned, whether good or bad. So I think my biggest advice is like, if you've done research and you've done a lot of research, stop, contact a realtor, (laughs) get on a list, and whether that's land options or home options, and get your first offer out there because more than likely, you're not going to get your first offer or your second offer, especially with the way things are going now. So get your first couple of no's out the way. And then on offer number three, like game on, get ready to do it. Like to me, I think getting started as soon as possible will ultimately be the best thing you ever did. Great, great, great advice. And last question, what is your favorite book or a recent book that you've read that has impacted your mindset? Uh, recently I read, I mean, about a year ago, I read David Green from Bigger Pockets, the Burr strategy. So it's like B-R-R-R-R stands for buy, Mm -hmm. rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. Um, cause I, I want to get into flipping and stuff like that. And I kind of already knew these concepts in general, but kind of having it in one nice place. There you go. Yeah. (laughs) Having it in one nice place and kind of like showing you how scalable real estate is, um, was very important for me. So while I'm not doing flips, 
the approaches in that book kind of helped me realize like, oh, real estate is very scalable, uh, you know, whether it's rehabs or Airbnb. So it's kind of like taking those tactics and trying to apply them in the Airbnb world. So again, I'm not rehabbing right now, but I will one day. And uh, that book really kind of unlocked scalability for me, I think. Yeah, David is a very, very smart guy and his books are are very good. I've got uh, the his real estate agent book here too sold that I haven't quite gotten around reading yet. But um, I mean, everything he writes is great. I love all his books. Yeah, I've uh, yeah listened to him many, 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 many times. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe one day I'll be on the Bigger Pockets podcast. Who knows? I hope so. I hope you are. I will. I'll definitely listen to your episode. And uh, okay, so uh, I think that is actually actually. Can I say something really fast? Yes, I listened to your episode, <laughs> and that's that. That's why I live here. I mean, honestly. Ooh. So you know, I listened to that, and I was like, "All right, Smoky Mountains is it? Game on, let's do it." And uh, bought a chalet here in September uh, through Short Term Shop, and yeah. Then after that was going well and everything, I was like, "All right, Tiny House Village in Gatlinburg, let's do this thing." So <laughs> I actually owe a lot of this to you. Thank you very much. Oh, well, you are so welcome. Thank you so much for saying that. I hope you don't regret it one day. <laughs> no, like, no, oh, so far, so good. No, I'm, <laughs> awesome. I got a nice mountain right over here that I get to look at every single day. So uh, I'm going to enjoy that. Amazing. Well, that makes me really happy because at the end of the day, the whole reason the short term shop exists is because that's how, you know, that's how I built my wealth and got out of my corporate job and how we got to financial freedom in our family. So it makes me happy when one of our clients is able to achieve the same thing and that we played even just the smallest part in that. Mm -hmm. So I really, I really love hearing that kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming on the show. Lots of really, really great, great tips here. So um, thank you so much. And uh, we will talk to you soon. Awesome. Bye, everybody.